wait till the end. <laughs> okay so yeah it, it now it is being recorded and so yeah so we are raffling off two wonderful books at the end of the session so please stick around and see if you win one of those two books so here we get started with the session itself so this is based on this discussion that we're going to have is based on a very good book called enough about me by the author whose name is richard louis now, Richard Louis made a very difficult decision. He left his job as a major anchor at NBC, and he did that to help care for his father in San Francisco, who was going through Alzheimer's. Now, it was a very difficult time, and um, even though it was a difficult time, he realized, Richard realized, that doing this selfless act actually had a positive overall impact on his well-being. So he decided to like dig into exploring acts of compassion from the lens of a reporter. So this book is partly scientific, part emotional. His journey is something that many of us will be able to relate to and hence is the focus of today's conversation. Now, for me, the author made four important points in his book. The first one is that all lives are worth living, including the ones of our seniors who are in frail condition, who may be in nursing homes. Number two, all great religions and great thinkers, they advocate um, selflessness. Simply put, it's more blessed to give rather than to receive. Thirdly, caregiving can be thankless. Even the person you care for may not understand how much you do and how much angst it may be causing you. But as the author himself says, what happens off camera is just as important as what happens on camera. And finally, there are significant benefits to oneself when one gives. Even bite-sized selfless acts result in a significant increase in mental and emotional well-being. So doing little things prepares us for bigger challenges in life. So this book, it resonated with me. I had a tenured faculty position at the state university. When my mom passed and my dad moved in with me, we faced a crisis situation almost right away. My father was diagnosed with stage three prostate cancer. He had to undergo treatment. And so at that time, of course, I had a full-time job. I was dealing with two teenagers going through typical teenage issues, an extremely busy husband, a dad with dementia who now also had cancer, and like the cherry on the top, a lack of support at my workplace. Now I dealt with all of this for several years before making the difficult decision to give up my job. When I was struggling with everything, trying to juggle everything, I attended a support group for caregivers of people who have memory issues. And that is where I met this absolutely wonderful person, Tammy Anastasia. Tammy is a, demen is a dementia consultant in the Bay Area. And she's also the author of a wonderful book that every caregiver should read. The, the title of her book is Essential Strategies for Dementia Caregivers, Learning to Pace Yourself. This is one of the two books that we will be raffling out, off at the end of the session. And the other book is, of course, Rich, Richard Louis' book. So Tammy is here and I have lots of questions for her and I'm sure you will have questions for her too. So please feel free to write your questions in the chat. So over to Tammy. Welcome, Tammy. Thank you. Thank you, Shai. So before we even get started, Tammy, let's get an idea of what our audience is all about. So how many of them are caregivers and so on? So how about we pop up this pop up a quiz? And if you guys can quickly just answer that quiz, that would be awesome. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> you can't see the quiz. No. Here, let me okay. try again. We are trying. So just hang on. There you go. Okay. So please go ahead and just quickly answer the quiz. And so we can get an idea of uh, who's facing what in our audience. Okay. 
I think that looks pretty much like what the, so we have one person who is the primary caregiver. We have a couple who are secondary caregivers and others who are not, neither, who are not caregivers at this point in time. But even then, let's just go ahead and dive right into our questions. Yeah. So, so Tammy, uh, what is the first thing you'd like to tell people in our audience who are caregivers for loved ones with Alzheimer's or dementia? So first off, what I'd like to do is just thank everybody for attending today. And also, I do want to thank every caregiver for the love, the support, and the compassion and, and care that you provide all of the time, whether you're a primary caregiver or secondary caregiver. But I do want to take time because, again, a lot of caregivers feel that it's thankless at some point, especially if they're the primary caregiver. So I do want to acknowledge that what you're doing is um, just beyond belief. And I truly believe every caregiver is an amazing person because of the demands and the challenges that caregivers face. The third thing I do want to say is when we're dealing with dementia, it's super, super important to know that we're not just dealing with memory loss. Dementia is a progressive, hold on here. Dementia is a progressive disease that affects almost every functionality in our cognition. So a lot of people get confused that, well, if my loved one doesn't have memory issues, then they don't have dementia. So dementia involves a progressive decline in thinking, language, problem solving, processing information, reasoning, uh, executive functioning, planning things, scheduling things. Um, even following directions becomes very, very difficult. So, and, and the term dementia is an umbrella term. A lot of people get dementia and Alzheimer's confused. They use them interchangeably. So I also wanna clarify what dementia is. Dementia is an umbrella term. Cancer is an umbrella term. We can have numerous cancers, but we call it cancer, what type of cancer. So dementia is an umbrella term for any cognitive impairment, but we can have over a hundred different kinds of cognitive impairment. But the four we hear about the most are Alzheimer's, which 70% of dementias are. Then we have vascular dementia, Lewy body dementia, and frontal temporal lobe. And it's very important to get an accurate diagnosis because depending on the type of dementia, is also going to determine the treatment, the course of treatment. So Lewy body, its signature is uh, they'll have hallucinations, they'll have delusions. Frontal temporal dementia, we'll see a lot more behavioral issues. And then Alzheimer's, you'll see primarily a lot of memory difficulties because it's the hippocampus part of the brain that's, that's getting attacked. So when you think dementia, what you also need to know is brain cells are dying, brain cells are deteriorating. So anything you're going through and what your loved one are going through, keep in mind, it's dementia. So I get a lot of questions, you know, I, my loved one's in denial. When we get a diagnosis of dementia, it's not denial. It truly is brain cells that are deteriorating. And that's an important distinction to make because you're gonna cope differently if you think denial, they're doing this intentionally. If you think dementia, it's the brain malfunctioning. And there's a significant difference between denial, which is not what's going on when you have a diagnosis of dementia versus dementia and brain cells are deteriorating. Okay. Um, so uh, one point that's mentioned by the author in the book that had me be feel a little, little bit skeptical is that he said that selflessness results in a greater feeling of well-being. Now, you have a lot of experience talking to people who are dealing with this, right? So have you personally seen improvement in the emotional and mental well-being of caregivers? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. So one of the first things I do want to say that I often caution my clients, private clients and in my support group, you do not want to compare yourself to anybody else. Your journey is your journey. 
And mental health and mental well being is going to be made up of several different factors. What your belief system is, what your cultural norms and expectations are, the relationship with your loved one prior to dementia, now going through dementia, what kind of support system do you have? So, in order to find meaning of this journey, it's going to be very individual. And I think we have to be very, very cautious. You don't want to compare yourself to anybody because quite frankly, everybody's doing the best that they can. And your dynamics with your loved one and who your chemistry is, who your makeup is, your mental well being, emotional well being, your physical well being, it's so individual. So, for him, selflessness it was something he got out of it. But also, what I think I also need to bring to people's attention, he was not the primary caregiver. Big, big, big difference between being the primary caregiver and not the primary caregiver. The primary caregiver, all the responsibility, all of the demands, all of the challenges fall on the shoulders of the primary caregiver. The non-primary caregiver, secondary primary, secondary caregiver, whatever we want to term them, they get to walk away. They get to, they get to take a break for the primary caregiver. So he's able to talk about selflessness and he was not the primary caregiver. So Shai, I know you're the primary caregiver. What being the primary caregiver, what has that, that been like for you? And how about your mental and emotional well-being? How would you say you've coped? Exactly. So that was the primary thought in my mind as I was reading the book, because I have been in the position where I have been the primary caregiver for many years. And to be very honest with you, when you're in the throes of caregiving, yeah. it's very hard to step outside of it and look at it and rationalize it or even think about it in terms of selflessness or how it's making your soul feel. Because when you are living with someone who has dementia and something as simple as answering the same question multiple times a day, yeah. that can be exhausting and it can literally be soul sucking. Yeah. And um, that is why I think it's so important that uh, primary caregivers get support in terms yep. of respite care yep. or like in my case um, I'm kind of going back to work which is yep. uh, which I'm some, something I'm actually really looking forward to because being the primary caregiver doesn't give you the luxury of sitting down and writing a book about it yeah 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 and I, I will be very honest I will tell you what I usually hear from primary caregivers I'm drowning I feel isolated I feel alone and I don't have any support. Mm -hmm. And so that's why support groups are so important or you know, seeking out one-on-one -on -one counseling and getting that, that validation you need and getting that support that you need. So the primary caregiver will often share those things about, you know, and friends disappear, family disappears. You know, when somebody has dementia, they change and they change, their personality can change, their thinking changes, their ability to process information changes, like I said earlier. And a lot of people don't know what to say and, and how to interact with somebody. So not only is the primary caregiver dealing with their loved one 24 seven, but they, their friends disappear. And so it becomes a very lonely, can be very lonely journey. And that's why we try to provide as many resources and support as possible because the family caregiver needs more, the primary caregiver needs more support than anybody else. And that is a big issue. So for Richard Louis, his experience was very different because I believe because he was the non-primary caregiver. However, that being said, I will say that this journey affects everybody. And in many ways, I think this journey affects the primary caregiver more than the person going through it. Mm -hmm. And I do feel it changes us. I think it changes people, whether you learn to be more patient, whether you learn to let things go. Like, you know, if your loved one wants to go to bed with their shoes on, you're not going to fight it because mm -hmm. you already, you're already are dealing with so many other issues. Mm -hmm. So there is meaning that we can get out of this journey. But here again, it depends on the individual 
And the last thing I, I want people to do is to fall into the comparison trap. You know, we're all doing the best that we can and you deserve to give yourself as much credit as possible and do not compare Jane to Peter, to Sam, to Paul. We're mm -hmm. all individuals and you're doing the very, very best that you can on any given day. And some yeah. days are gonna be better than others. Yeah, and I do want to add that uh, um, in order to feel a, a greater feeling of well-being, it's important that you're doing the right amount of caregiving and you're getting the right amount of time for self-care as well. Yeah, and self-care is probably uh, the most difficult. It is incredibly difficult. And as you know, Shai, um, to take time out for yourself. And so one of the things I encourage people to do, caregivers get thinking, in terms of what I don't have time for. And I try to reverse that thinking and start thinking in increments of 10 minutes. What can I do today for 10 minutes that would be nurturing and comforting? But when you're in the throes of it and dealing with all of these challenges and demands, it is really, really, really difficult for the caregiver, the primary caregiver to take a time out. And you really have to make a conscious effort to make yourself that priority. So, and, and, and caregivers will share with me, you know, people expect me to take an hour out and go exercise and do this and they're exhausted. How mm -hmm. am I gonna go out and do exercise? It's that catch 22. And caregiver burnout, caregiver stress, caregiver depression, those percentages are very, very high. But we have found 10 minutes of something is better than doing nothing. So I want you to think in terms of what can I do today for 10 minutes that would be nurturing and comforting. It's a way of reminding you that you're as important as the person you're taking care of. And it's a way of giving back to yourself. Mm -hmm. It's a way of taking care of yourself because it gives you that brief time out from the demands emotionally, physically, and mentally. It's just enough of a break to rejuvenate yourself and collect yourself versus depleting your energy across the board. Yeah, and Tammy, isn't there a statistic around uh, caregivers who burn out? Sometimes they pass away even before the person they're caring for? Yeah, the statistic is not good. 63% um, uh, of caregivers, primary caregivers will pass away before their loved one. That's how demanding and challenging this disease is. So we really, really, really try to encourage caregivers to take a time out for themselves with the realization of how incredibly difficult it is to do that. Yeah. But statistically, yes, it's and, and in my support groups, I have it in, in my private practice, the caregivers that I've worked with have passed away before their loved ones because of the stress. That is so and, incredibly sad. Yeah, very, very sad. So my next question to you is kind of related to this, but just from a different angle. Yeah. So um, when it comes to caregiving, in many cases, we are, we know we cannot restore our loved ones to good health. Yeah. That's not going to happen. Yeah. We only will see decline. Yeah. So how can one stay sane through something like this? So one is what we just talked about, taking that time out for yourself. You know, I, I have the saying, and it's in my book, you know, letting your health suffer is not going to make your loved one better. Mm -hmm. And I know that must sound harsh. And I know that that must, that that's a hard thing to hear, but letting your health suffer isn't going to make them better. So one thing for sure to do is to, again, take time out for yourself. The second thing I'm going to recommend is to educate yourself about this disease. Educate yourself about how it's going to change your loved one and how are you going to cope with these changes, which is what actually inspired me to write my book, right? Because the changes are accumulative and it's a progressive disease, which means it's only going to get worse over time. Mm -hmm. So the better educated you are, the more prepared you're going to be to deal with the demands and the challenges that are caused by somebody with dementia. And then the third thing that I cannot stress enough is support, support, support. You cannot have enough support in my eyes. The better, the more support you have, the better. 
because support is important. And what do I mean by support? Not only support from family and friends, but resources. Rely on community resources, faith-based resources, professional resources. One of the best things caregivers can do very, very early on is to admit and acknowledge what your limitations are. And it's really hard to do that because we have this commitment to our loved one. We have these expectations, whether they're culturally imposed, self-imposed, or family imposed that I should be there and be able to do this on my own. When in reality, this disease requires more care than one person can handle on their own. And Shai, what's been your experience in terms of support? How has lack of support affected you? And now what do you do for support? Yeah, so, so definitely. So um, uh, for the longest time, for many years, I did carry the load alone. Mm -hmm. um, uh, my dad did split his time between me and a brother who's in Australia. Yeah. But when he was with me, it was me and me alone. Yes. And so uh, I found myself getting more and more depressed as time went by. Yes. But it was this very quiet kind of depression that doesn't show outside. Yes. It's something that only I am aware of. Yes. And, um, and also I found myself losing interest in things I normally like to do. Yes. So um, I think... To some extent, I've been very lucky that I've suddenly landed a new job. Yes. And I'm going to be running a school. Yes. And, um, and as a result of that, um, I feel alive again. I feel as if my brain cells have come back to life. Yeah. And I did not know how much I missed thinking and talking to people and solving problems. Now yeah. I realize it. That sense of purpose outside of um, being just a quote unquote caregiver. Can mm -hmm. you share a little bit about what that feeling was though inside that you felt, you know, you said that you felt, you know, depressed and it was inside. Can you kind of share what that feeling was like? Yeah. So I think it's actually, you, you mentioned an analogy that was pretty perfect. The feeling of drowning. Yeah. Because you feel you're drowning and you feel that you're screaming inside, but nobody can hear you scream yeah. because you are surrounded by people, at least in my case, and I'm sure that's true for many people who are depending on you. So children yeah. who are depending on you, your father who, or, or your mother or whoever you're taking care of depending on you, and you have to be the solid rock. Yeah. So even if you're not a solid rock at the core, on the outside, you have to pretend like you are a solid rock. Right. And right. That's, that's how I can describe it. Yeah. And so there we go, right? How do you process your feelings? How do you deal with your feelings? And this is what happens. We shut down, we repress those feelings. And yet we have to, we have to find ways to cope. And again, when you go back to those statistics, now you can see why 63% of caregivers, right, may pass away before their loved ones, because what do we do with this intensity, this day in and day out feelings that we have? There's got to be an outlet. But again, the sooner you can recognize your limitations, the sooner you can acknowledge your limitations, we can put resources in place to give you that break and have an identity outside of being a primary caregiver and re-engage with, you know, your friends and go to coffee or go to a movie, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, and COVID hasn't helped. COVID has definitely made things way worse from the isolation standpoint and the loneliness standpoint, mm -hmm. which now we need to make even a bigger effort to reach out and try to connect with people. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, congratulations on the new job. Thank you so much. Yeah. And this, I think, is the perfect time for us to introduce the acronym, the very important acronym that you mentioned in your, in your book, P-A-C-E. I would love for you to describe what that stands for. Okay. So um, learning to pace yourself, P-A-C-E, is, is pretty much the um, whole purpose of the book. The P stands for give yourself permission to trial and error. This journey is an up and down journey. And a lot of times in order to figure out what works is by figuring out what doesn't work. I hate to say it, but somebody with dementia changes on a dime. And one strategy might work for that hour. And then three hours later, you try to implement that strategy and it may not work, right, Shai? There's so many changes. So there is no perfect roadmap 
other than give yourself permission to trial and error. Allow mistakes to be opportunities to learn from because basically this dementia is a learning process constantly. You're learning all along the way. And I don't want you to give up on yourself. I don't want you to blame yourself. I don't want you to think you're doing things wrong. Mistakes are opportunity to learn. So I talk a lot about that. Then the A stands for acknowledge their reality. Their brain starting to deteriorate. They're going to have an altered version of reality now. And your reality and their reality are not going to be the same. So you, know, you need to know what to expect. How is, how is their brain going to change? How is it going to be different? So I talk about how dementia is going to change your loved one and also equip you with skills and strategies and techniques on how to deal with all of those changes. So the most difficult part about this is, is you have your reality and now their reality becomes very different. They can become accusatory. They become paranoid. They start saying you're stealing things from them because they don't remember where they hid things, right? Any of this resonate, Shai? Right? Yeah. So, uh, so A, that's what the A is all about. Teaching you and letting you know what changes are coming down the pike in terms of them and then how to equip you on how to deal with those. The C stands for compassionate care. Compassionate care. In this section, I talk about how to communicate with people with dementia and how to take care of people with dementia compassionately, but also how to take care of yourself compassionately. And in that section is where I actually spend a lot of time talking about the resentment and how to deal with resentment, how to deal with the anger, the loss, the sadness, this person you love that you've known for so many years is changing. And in some ways you feel very disconnected and how do we find ways of connecting now with them as they have this new altered version of reality. So compassion care is how to communicate compassionately with the loved one, but more importantly, how to compassionately take care of yourself and be compassionate. You know, self-talk is super important. Judging yourself, criticizing yourself. There's, it's not about criticizing and judging yourself, how to be supportive of yourself. And mm -hmm. caregiver guilt, I spend a lot of time talking about how to deal with caregiver guilt. Mm -hmm. And then the E stands for empower yourself. So this has a couple different directions. The E talks about educating yourself, not only about the disease, but also dementia for as unpredictable as dementia can be, there are times there might be patterns. So you want to see if you can identify any patterns. For example, I had a client and, um, and I've used this story many times because it's so poignant that when he would walk into the house to see his dad, 90% of the time he was thrilled to see him. But there were times he walked in the door and the father would just scream, get out of my house, you don't belong here, I don't know who you are, and he'd kick him out. Because we tried to identify if there were any patterns, we found it, it was when he wore anything red, a red hat, a red shirt, anything red caused a reaction from his father. There's no way we could have figured that out if we didn't go looking for patterns. So you want to look for patterns. In my book, I have, you know, observation logs, what to look for and how to do that. And then also I line up the ducks. This is what's coming down the pike. At some time, you're going to either have to have 24 hour home care, or we're going to have to place them in a care community. And I talk about how to hire a home care agency, talk about, again, educating you on the questions to ask, what to look for, how to know when it's time to place your loved one. And I just walk you all the way through, um, you know, hospice care and what to look for and how to do that. So empowering yourself is giving you the tools, giving you the language, giving you the questions and helping you line up your ducks and anticipating what's going to be coming down, down the road. Wow, that's that's incredible. And I, I really wish I had your book when I started the journey because this is all such valuable information for any caregiver. 
Yeah, you know, what inspired me to write the book are several things. One, to validate what the caregiver is going through and to normalize what you're going through and to provide you with tools and tips on how to survive this and to conserve your energy. That's the thing, right? Caregiver burnout, stress, depression, because we're depleting our energy, depleting our energy. And I wanted to teach people on how to pace themselves through this journey. So it's not at the expense of your physical, mental, and emotional well-being. Because mm -hmm. in the end, it's how do you survive this? And it's not at the expense of your own health. And yeah. I think that I had to give back. I had to do something to help people survive this journey better. Yeah. Very, and this book is absolutely a gem. So uh, I think at this point, let's see if our audience has any okay. questions for you. So guys, if you have any questions for Tammy, please uh, type that into chat and uh, we can have Tammy answer those questions. Okay. Anybody? Um, while we're waiting for questions, how about I ask you a very frequently asked question, which yes. was my biggest challenge at one point. Yes. How do you deal with being asked the same question over and over and over? Yeah, so um, fortunately that's in my book, um, but I will answer that. And here's the answer to that. When someone with dementia is asking repetitive questions, there's often a need behind that question. It may be a concern. It may be something they're afraid of. It may be something that's very important to them. It may be something that's very memorable. So you wanna start paying attention to what questions they're asking. And if we know what the need is, we're gonna know how to respond to it. Mm -hmm. But when they're asking repetitive questions, the other thing that can cause that to happen is if their brain's not engaged enough. If the brain isn't engaged in activities and they're not distracted and they're not utilizing their, their brain cells in some way, mm -hmm. the brain tends to get what I call bored, B-O-R-E-D, and it starts to ruminate and ruminate and ruminate. So a couple ways to deal with it is you always want to validate that you hear them. So I have two wonderful validating phrases and you say, thank you for sharing that with me. Thank you for letting me know how you feel. The second response is now you've got to provide an empathetic response. An empathetic response has to be a response that is comforting and reassuring. So mm -hmm. that's why we got to listen to the type of questions they're asking because there's a need. And so they need to know I'm going to resolve the problem for them. I'm going to take care of whatever it is that's on their mind. But first, I have to hear what is the need? What are they asking? So I know how to respond to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, we have like lots of questions. Oh, I'm right. sorry, I thought you were done. Um, the one more thing about repetitive questions. And then what happens is, and again, it's something I do point out in my book is you come up with two or three phrases that you can use interchangeably. Because repetitive questions is one thing that depletes the primary caregivers energy more than anything. So yeah. know that when they're repeating something, there's a need there, try to see if you can figure out what the need is. Yeah, and I can think of an example right away. So be yeah. helping my dad orient as far yep. as time is yes. concerned. So yes. I got this big digital clock that yep. displays the time, the the day, the week, the the, the month, the year, everything. Yeah. So, yeah, so you don't have to repeat it all the time. And we use whiteboards a lot for day mm -hmm. and time things as well. So good for you, Shai. So, so yeah, so here there's a really good question. So yes. the question is, do the strategies in the book, and this question comes from Michelle, do the strategies in this book apply to other neurological uh, de degenerative diseases? That's a great question. I will tell you this, the, 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 the techniques in this book can work with anybody, whether they have a, a degenerative brain disease. There are techniques that would be great just communicating with everybody. Wouldn't you say, Shai? 
um, you know, listening, validating, empathizing. These are things that we should be doing, communicating with people even without a brain disease. And I have gotten feedback. Usually when I do webinars, I get feedback. Oh, God, Tammy, these tips would work with people who don't have a brain brain disease. Mm -hmm. But yes, I think there are techniques that are applicable to a lot of different areas of our life. Mm -hmm. I think one of the conditions that Ruby mentions is Parkinson's. Yes. Like a person with Parkinson's who has dementia. So would these strategies help? And you say it will help, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, brain disease or no brain disease, you think about this. Every single person has a need to feel heard and understood. Mm -hmm. That's an innate need within all of us. And in the book are ways on how to do that. And whether or not, again, you have a brain disease, Parkinson's, Lewy body, autism, these techniques, it's all about letting the individual know, I hear you mm -hmm. and I understand and I am there for you. That's more than anything else in the world is being listened to and heard. Mm -hmm. And it's an innate need, whether we have, again, a brain disorder or not. It's mm -hmm. an internal need we all have. And how many times, think about yourselves, and Shai, you too. How many times have you shared a story with somebody and they dismissed it or they minimized it or they discounted it? You get off the phone angry. They didn't listen. They didn't hear what you said. Mm -hmm. It is so incredibly important. If we don't do anything else, we have to listen. Listen, exactly. And that's the hardest thing, but it's the most important thing. It well. truly is. We all want to be heard. We all want to be listened to. Mm -hmm. So uh, another question, great question that just came in. How, and this is from Reed. How do people handle the guilt involved with care, caretaking? Yeah, so guilt, unfortunately, um, a lot of times I have this philosophy that guilt is where we go when we don't know how to deal with certain other emotions and we internalize it. So it is incredibly sad to watch your loved one deteriorate. It is, it can get you very angry and get you very frustrated. And when I don't know what to do with those feelings, guilt is a great place to go, right? Guilt's a great place to put my feelings and emotions into. The problem with that is guilt implies you're doing something wrong. And here's what I want you all to hear today. Dementia is responsible for what you and your loved one are going through. You are not at fault and your loved one is not at fault. Mm -hmm. And so this guilt that we impose on ourselves, and again, cultural messaging, right? And so in the book, I replace guilt with compassionate self-talk, compassionate self-understanding. I'm not asking you to lie to yourself. What mm -hmm. I'm saying is make statements of fact that do not make you the bad person because in the end, Dementia is dictating the terms. Dementia is forcing you to make decisions. You are not the bad person. You're not at fault. Dementia mm -hmm. is causing these things to happen. And so we have to replace that guilt and focus on dementia being the problem and not you. And I think a great, a great follow-up question to that is actually from Nagja is how do you deal with the guilt if you get to a place where you have to place your loved one in a care facility? So one of the most difficult decisions, the two most difficult decisions a caregiver faces is when or if to place their loved one. And the second most difficult question they have to deal with is whether to deal with a life-threatening medical situation. Both are extreme decisions that have to be made often when you're a dementia caregiver. So when we're looking at placing somebody into a care community, we have to take the focus off of you being, you know, not, how can I say this? Not upholding your vows, not upholding your promises to your loved one. Dementia demands more care. So the way I like to do that is two things. We come up with physical reasons why we have to place them in the care home. They're falling more frequently. They're incontinent. I can't deal with it. They're refusing my help. So I come up with what we call markers or indicators that now take the focus off of me and become about dementia. And it's the dementia that demands more attention. The dementia, dementia demands more help. That being said, 
your love and your care and your support don't stop. These communities are an extension of your love. They're an extension of the care that you're providing. So all we're doing is, is we're providing more care for your loved one because dementia demands more. Dementia and your loved one deserves the best care possible. That's going to extend beyond you. So if we look at it as an extension of care, an extension of love, then it's not about me abandoning my loved one. It's not about me going against their vows. We all would like to, to be able to live our lives till at home. Most, you know, statistically, we see that very high. However, the reality is when you have dementia, it often can't be one person. We either bring in 24 hour care or we have to place them because we have to attend to the needs that dementia demands. And finally, I think this is a great question to end with. Um, is there something people can do as parents age to prepare for this stage of life? And actually, let me add something else. All yes. of us are growing older, whether we like it or not. So what, yes. is, what, what can we do as we age? What, how can we prepare? So here again, I think the best thing that we could do to prepare is, you know, especially now, aging is costly. And I think we have to look at, you know, if I'm going to live 70, 80, 90 years, I think we have to look at what's, what resources are available for us and financially, how are we going to afford it? I mean, I have to bring that out. Care is not cheap. Mm -hmm. And so we have to financially prepared, whether it's retirement, whether it's, you know, um, a trust fund or whether it's, uh, you know, Medi-Cal, I hate to say it or mm -hmm. Medicare, but we have to plan financially and we have to also look at what are the resources available to us. And I think that's what's really important nowadays because we are living longer and the longer we live, I hate to say it, the costlier it's becoming. So mm -hmm. I think we have to just pre-plan ahead in terms of what does that look like financially, physically, mentally, and emotionally? And do we stay in California or do we go somewhere else, right? These are all things I think we have to factor into today in terms of longevity. And, and I will say this, you know what? I'm glad this came up. It's a great question. You have to have your will and trust done. Get these legal documents done. Get the medical form signed, a POA of finances, a POA of, of uh, medical, power of attorney, POA. Mm -hmm. Um, get the post, the bright, bright, bright pink, get that post filled out, fill out the HIPAA form, have in DNR, get these things taken care of. God forbid, if something should happen to you, have all the passwords of your children, your parents, anything done online, your own passwords, easily accessible, have the emergency phone numbers of the doctors and the medications written out. These are all things today we have to be doing in preparation for our own longevity, as well as those that are aging before us. Oh, wow. So, so all that advice that you just mentioned in the nutshell, that yeah. could be a whole discussion by itself. Yes. So, yes. Uh, but I think that's, that's a really a great note on which we can end today's uh, discussion. So any final thoughts before we say goodbye to our audience? Um, yeah, I have one final thought to maybe just sort of summarize what I just said today, and that mm -hmm. is dementia requires both taking care of ourselves as well as taking care of our loved ones. And the better we take care of ourselves, the better we will make this journey, the easier this journey will be on us. Um, and again, it's a fine line between taking care of ourselves and taking care of others. And all I'm asking is to make yourself an equal, not a less than, so that somehow the care you're putting into your loved one, somehow we find a way to balance some care coming back to you. That's great. That's wonderful advice. Thank you so much, Tammy. It was wonderful talking to you. And um, oh, yes, uh, before we wrap up, uh, Nadja will tell us who won the raffles. Um, who won the books um, in the raffle. Great. So, Nadja? Shai, thank you for having me. Oh, you're, you're very welcome. Okay, so I have here a hat and I've put everybody's name in the hat. So I'm first going to pull out one name and that's going to be the winner for Tammy's book. So here we go. And the winner is... 
Manisha. Manisha so sure wins, we... uh, wins Tammy's book. Yay. So Great. Manisha, if you can put your um, address in the chat, that would be awesome. That would be great. Yep. And now this is the, I'm pulling out for the Richard Louis book. And the winner for this one is iPhone. Who, okay. who's, on, who's on the iPhone? <laughs> <laughs> who's on the iPhone? That's a great question. <laughs> is there someone who's named iPhone here? On that was on, on the chat. On the participant, the chat. it was there was an iPhone. Is there someone there now? Or um, I'm asking iPhone to unmute. So let's see. I'm on the iPhone. Can you oh. hear me? Yes, yes, yes. What's if, your name? I'm the, I find the only one. Um, I'm glad I didn't win Tammy's book because I was probably one of the first to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Paula. Hi, Tammy. Um, yeah, I'm Paula Quinterno. Congratulations, Tammy. Paula, on having won the second book. Yeah. Thank you. And do I share think... your address with us in the in the chat so we can. I get don't. The I don't know how to chat. <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll I'll give it to them, Paula. Knows it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Congrats, Great. Paula. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, everybody, job, and yeah. uh, until next time. Goodbye. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye. Bye -bye.